Hey, will somebody please pass the ketchup? <laughs> this is a tasty burger. I'll take a Gordon's burger and slide of Jason's finger. Don't skip on the meat. Uh, I got a real good eye for prime meat. <laughs> Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat and monsters. I'm Noah Hook, and today I'll be taking you all through every movie I watched in March and April. It's going to be mostly horror, but there is one exception. The format's going to go like this. I'll start with any movies that I have rewatched. These will usually be my personal favorites or comfort movies. Then will come older movies that I'm watching for the first time, so anything that came out before like 2020. And finally, I'll wrap things up with any new movies that I watch for the first time. After that, I'm going to do a rough ranking of the movies. It won't be a very solid best to worst tier list or anything like that, but more about my experience with them or how excited I am about these movies. In my first episode, I included TV, but I think I'm just going to stick with movies from now on. I'm more of a movie person in general, and with this new format, I think it makes more sense. Oh, I'm also not going to include movies that I have or will make reviews of, because you can go see my thoughts there. So no Hannibal Lecter in this list, folks. But without further ado, why don't we jump in? Starting off my rewatches is one of my comfort films, as it's one I've seen since I was like six years old. It's got buff men and a badass monster, and it's none other than 1987's Predator. I love this movie so much. For me, it's the epitome of 80s action horror. I honestly just love anything with Arnie in it. Obviously Terminator is probably his most well-regarded film, but throw on Conan, Total Recall, Last Action Hero, anything like that and I will be having a great time. But out of all of Arnold's films, Predator is by far my favorite. I'm sure this is mostly nostalgia talking, but for me the premise of watching these trained soldiers be hunted so easily has always just really worked well for me. We spend the first 30 minutes just doing typical action movie shit with as many guns, squibs, and fire stunts as possible. I'm actually not that into action movies and these kinds of reoccurring stunts really don't keep me invested in a film throughout. But then the movie flips those action expectations and basically becomes a slasher movie. The ensemble cast is a ton of fun and provides Preddy with a bunch of people to show off his cool weapons on. The Predator's unveiling near the end is so cool, and it's just a fantastic practical effect. It's up there in my favorite effects of all time with classics like The Thing and Pumpkinhead, so it's in really good company. Realistically, I know it isn't an all-time great film or anything like that. There isn't much emotional weight or deep symbology going on. And certain aspects like the Predator's thermal vision look pretty dated. But if you go in looking for a lot of action and a lot of suspense, you won't be disappointed. I watch Predator probably every two to three years and will continue to do so for the rest of my life probably, and I definitely hope to cover the entire franchise at some point on the channel. It has memorable characters, a great jungle setting, a fierce finale, and one of the greatest movie monsters of all time. Speaking of cool movie monsters, up next is 1998's The Faculty. This sci-fi horror follows a ragtag group of students who discover their Ohio high school is being taken over by aliens. They team up together to take on the parasitic creatures which will stop at nothing to take over their minds and bodies. The Faculty came out just one year after Scream and it definitely shows in the sarcastic, on-the-nose dialogue. I mean, it was written by Kevin Williamson, so it really is just Scream but Ghostface as an alien. <laughs> The characters are stereotypes and they realize it, and I think most of that humor works for me here. They do a good job of humanizing the characters as well as playing up the paranoia of who has been turned. It really takes a page right out of the thing and has the kids snort caffeine pills to test themselves, and there are a lot of homages to earlier Alien movies like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So it's cool to see this Scream style referencing outside of the slasher genre. Extraterrestrial horror needs love too. I really like the unique intricacies this alien species has, and boy that alien queen is a really impressive effect. Some of the CGI is pretty dated, but it doesn't distract too much. It's definitely a product of its time, so you probably already know if you're going to like it or not. All in all, The Faculty is a fun spin on the alien invasion story, and it utilizes tropes from that as well as high school dramas to craft a pretty solid movie. 
Up next, we've got a double feature with both of the Hills Have Eyes remakes. The first is a pretty straightforward remake of Wes Craven's original, which follows a family being hunted in the Nevada desert by mutated cannibals. The sequel follows a group of military trainees that find themselves in the same hills after finding a research base has been massacred. Both movies really amp up the violence and gore, and they can be uncomfortable watches at times. Both have pretty graphic sexual assault, so if you're sensitive to that, you may want to skip these two. But the first one successfully pushes the ideas Craven was trying to go for at the time, which explores what happens to an average family when put into an extreme situation. We watch the family get viciously attacked, and the movie kind of turns into a revenge flick from there. There is a genuine feeling of catharsis as the family fights back and gets their revenge. The Hill people have some really cool designs, and I like how they played with the idea of the nuclear family. The second is not as good as the first, the violence and cool mutants are still there, but it just doesn't have the emotional weight that the first one does. All the characters are awful army stereotypes, and it really copies the first one down to a T. Okay, now let's move on to the older movies I've watched for the first time, and I have to say this is an odd group of films. First up is a low-budget 2008 horror movie called Splinter. The film follows a couple that is kidnapped by an escaped convict, and they just happen to run into an alien parasite hoping to consume them at a gas station. Splinter has some surprisingly solid practical effects going on, and they definitely aren't afraid to get up close and gnarly with them. Aside from the gore, the movie is pretty ho-hum. The acting is okay, the gas station setting is a bit dull, and the tiny cast makes it pretty clear there won't be many meaningful casualties along the way. Shea Wiggum does a good job as Dennis, but the other two leads are not my favorites. The script never takes itself too seriously, which helps make it a bit more enjoyable, and I'm always interested to see what a small group can do with a pretty tight constraints. It isn't a bad movie by any means, but it probably isn't one I'm going to revisit anytime soon. Up next is a movie I've been meaning to watch for years now, and that movie is Doom. This loose video game adaptation follows a group of space marines sent to a research facility on Mars, only to find the experiments there have created some unexpected mutations. Doom was cheesy as hell, it had cliché military characters, a predictable heel turn, and was pretty thin on the exposition. But for a movie like Doom, that's okay, it's clearly meant to be more fun than deep or introspective, and I think it succeeds at its goals. Characters like Portman, Destroyer, and Pinky were very entertaining, and did I mention the stars of The Rock? I don't love seeing Dwayne Johnson star in every other action film that comes out nowadays, but back in the early 2000s, his character still had some variety to them. It's pretty rare to see him as a villain, so while it was very predictable in the movie, it was still fun to see, if that makes sense. If you enjoy Resident Evil or Mortal Kombat, you'll probably like Doom as well. I never played the video game as a kid, so I'm sure there were also a bunch of references that went right over my head, but I was still able to have a lot of fun with it. Up next might be my hottest take of this whole video. In preparation for X, which I still haven't watched yet, I threw on Ty West's House of the Devil. This 2009 horror is a throwback to 70s and 80s occult films, and follows a college student named Samantha as she takes a questionable job watching over a man's elderly mother. Pair that with a lunar eclipse and it's clear there was something sinister in store for Samantha. This movie is rated pretty highly, but I'm sad to say I was pretty disappointed in it. First off, it is incredibly slow. like. There are so many extended sequences where we just watch Samantha wash dishes or walk down a sidewalk for seemingly no reason other than padding the runtime. I don't mind a slow burn, but The House of the Devil was also really predictable. There are no twists and turns, the movie plays it completely straight. At first I really appreciated the homage to this genre with little things like the cinematography and having Tom Noonan in it but the whole time I was waiting for it to break away from what it was replicating and do something new, but it sadly never did. It was a well-made movie, and if you like occult horror you might love The House of the Devil, but I personally was expecting a lot more from it. Up next is a fucking weird one. It's the oldest movie on this list, and it's sort of the oldest movie I've ever talked about on this channel. 
It's called The Curse of Bigfoot and was released in 1975, although most of the movie is actually from a 1958 film called Teenagers Battle the Thing, which was filmed by the same guy. The director basically filmed a couple new scenes and treated the first film as the story being told within it, and I don't even know where to start with this damn thing. It had an incredibly low budget, even for the time. Look at this thing. It is supposed to be a Bigfoot. The acting is wildly bland, and the really low-grade film makes it nearly impossible to tell what's going on, but that's okay because almost nothing happens this entire movie. There are so many extended scenes of characters just walking around, I'd wager there was probably 30 minutes of just that. There are scenes that are meant to be night but are clearly day, and the scenes actually shot at night are pitch black. The basic plot is a high school archaeology class visits Native American land and finds a mummy, which breaks loose and starts killing. It's actually only referred to as a Bigfoot in the opening sequence that was reshot in 1974, and it just does not look like a Bigfoot. The wraparound also has no conclusion, we never revisit the teacher telling this story at the end, it just ends when they kill the Bigfoot. If you like classic monster movies, you might have fun with it, but be warned, you will not be on the edge of your seats at any moment. I was smiling during most of the movie, but mostly in a it's-so-bad-it's-good way. The movie does have a few cool shots, and I do have a soft spot for that grainy film look, but those small charms cannot negate the dull story here. I'm happy I watched The Curse of Bigfoot, but I will probably never watch it again. Alright, all that's left are the new movies that I've watched. First up, we've got 2021's The Night House. I had high hopes for this one, as it's directed by David Ruckner, who directed one of my recent favorite horror movies, The Ritual. The Night House follows a recent widow named Beth, who begins feeling her husband's presence after he commits suicide. She slowly pieces together that he had more than a few secrets in life, and they might just be related to a plan for the afterlife. Rebecca Hall brings her A-game in the night house as we watch her process her grief as well as make those shocking discoveries about her seemingly happy life. The cinematography really stands out, and Bruckner makes great use of the unique home the story takes place in. I feel like it's hard to make a truly unique haunted house movie this day and age, but there were enough twists and turns to keep me guessing throughout. It's more of a slow burn that builds up in dread as you go along, but I'd say the last half hour really amps up the pressure. Tonally, it feels a bit like The Invisible Man, probably due to the possibly dead husband aspect, but it really plays with Beth's reliability as the narrator. Overall, I think The Night House is one of 2021's best horror movies, and I definitely recommend it if you haven't seen it. Okay, the last movie I'll be talking about is also the newest, and it's also the only one that isn't horror, and it also might be my favorite on this whole list. The film is called Everything Everywhere All at Once, and it is a fantastic sci-fi drama. I really don't want to spoil the plot, as it's a movie you should absolutely go watch on your own, but if you're okay with learning a bit, proceed with caution. The film follows a mother named Evelyn who struggles with her dead-end business, weak-willed husband, disapproving father, and rebellious daughter. It's just another crappy day when she's suddenly made aware of the multiverse, and must use the skills of every Evelyn in existence to take on an all-powerful villain hoping to destroy them all. The movie has a great balance of comedy, drama, and action, and it really brings to mind questions around our own identities. The film explores how different Evelyn's life could be if she made one tiny different decision as she comes to terms with what could have been. But the story goes far beyond what you might be expecting as these multiverses really push the extremes of what life could look like. The film really integrates themes, tropes, and stereotypes from Asian media and culture in a really entertaining and stimulating way. The movie is an absolute feast for the eyes, and it also pulls on the heartstrings with the familial relationships that are explored. So much ground is covered in the film, and keeps such a fast pace and never feels like it's wasting time, despite taking so many strange detours throughout the story. I came in with pretty high hopes, and my expectations were shattered. It's still early to say, but I expect Everything Everywhere All at Once to be my favorite film of the entire year. Well, that's every movie I watched in March and April. It's a pretty eclectic group of films, but I was pretty happy with most of them. 
It's kind of weird to rank such different films, but I'm gonna give it a shot anyway. This ranking will be a mix of how much I enjoyed the film, along with its overall quality. It's by no means a definitive list, I just want to give you an idea of what I had the best experiences with. Dead Last sadly goes to The Curse of Bigfoot. It was a fun novelty watch, but it really wasn't worth the time. Ninth place is going to go to The Hills Have Eyes 2, because it is a pretty pointless, generic, mid 2000s sequel with way too much emphasis on rape. 8th place will go to Splinter, as it's a middle-of-the-road, low-budget horror. It had some surprisingly good effects, but the limited scope of the film quickly lost my interest. Number 7 goes to The House of the Devil. It was well acted and well shot, but it was really just an hour and a half of homage without breaking any new ground. There were a couple unexpected moments, but generally it was extremely predictable. Sixth place is gonna go to Doom, as it's a fun movie, but I don't have the nostalgia to make it something I would watch very often. Number 5 is where I genuinely start to like the movies, and it goes to The Faculty. It's also big on homage, but has enough humor and originality to keep you guessing throughout. I also just love big ass monsters. Fourth place will go to The Night House, because it is a well acted, well paced, suspenseful horror movie. I don't think I'll revisit it too often, but I was genuinely impressed with it on my first viewing. Number 3 goes to the first Hills Have Eyes remake. It really pushes the concepts Craven was going for in the original, and it gives the plot a jolt of energy. Most would probably have it lower on the list, but I do have a soft spot for mutant cannibal movies. This may be contentious, but I'm gonna give the silver medal to Predator. It's a personal favorite of mine, and it has some really iconic moments. It's the only film on this list that's a genuine classic, and it has earned that title. But with that being said, I'm gonna give the number one spot to everything, everywhere, all at once. It's hard to compare this to a bunch of horror movies, but I really had a fantastic experience watching it in the theater. I really just want people to go experience it for themselves. If you take one thing away from this list, it's that you should go watch everything, everywhere, all at once in theaters if it's still available near you. It's a hilarious, heartfelt movie, and I really think it's something special. Well, that's about it. This was a ton of fun, and I look forward to ranking more random-ass movies in the future. What's your favorite out of this bunch? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you all for joining me, and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook, and thanks for watching Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching me review everything I watched in March and April. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with all my horror content. And if you want to and if you want to help support the channel further, you should check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks y'all.